Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Human Echoes Recap. We're coming back at you with Game of Thrones Season 7 Episode 1. The episode is named Dragonstone. I'm Tony Southcott and joining me is... Albert Berg! Mr. What Berg. What up? Oh, it's been more than a year since we got to do this for Game of Thrones. Winter is here. Yes, winter. In the middle of summer. <laughs> it is currently 85 degrees in my bedroom. I'm sweating like a pig. It felt good to see some White Walkers wandering around. It was almost like air conditioning. No, it wasn't. I just wanted to be there. Just it, It's... I, in some ways, I'm lucky I live in Florida because there's nev- there's no place without central air. Oh, they all have central air. Any newer place has central air in Colorado. I'm just in a place that was built in, like, 1914. Well, that's a problem. For yeah. You. Not about the episode, though. <laughs> anyway. Which, let's get into... Uh, you mentioned this is called Dragonstone, which is a little bit of a tease, I would say. It took us a long time to get to Dragonstone. We kick things off with an amazing cold open, uh, which we don't get very often. Usually they kick right off into the credits, but we start off with uh, what looks like Walder Frey uh, bringing his guys back together. And this was, I don't know about you, but the second that he said, well, you're wondering why I've brought you back together (laughs) after we already had a feast. I was like, well, this isn't a flashback. This is this is Arya. Yeah, that was a uh, that was my thought too. I was like, "All right, we're opening with Walder. Is this a flashback, or is she able to also get taller, change her voice, and know exactly how to be like Walder Frey for this?" Which is all Did powers. Did that bother that, you? No, it didn't at all. I was just uh, I sometimes wonder how much she actually got from her training if she like is perfectly able to emulate. So it's good to have that answer too. Yeah, that seems like the kind of thing that the books, when they finally get around to it, will either do differently or explain more. But it, with within the context of this, it worked fine. We know that she can change shapes. Uh, we assume that she can change voices to a certain extent. So here she is, setting these all these guys up. And, I mean, it, it, it was a really cool sort of follow-up to the way we ended last season, because last season had that great emotional gut punch of like, ha ha, Arya got what she was coming for and, and killed the man on her list. But from a practical standpoint, if she's actually going to send a message here and actually re- avenge the deaths of her family, it wasn't Walder Frey personally who plunged the knife into anybody's chest. He orchestrated it, but she needs to take out the rest of these folks. And I love that they followed that up. Yeah, it, I mean, like, they had to do a full-on, like, take out the entire family thing. I remember back in the day when Arya just had, like, seven names on her list. She uh, she upped her kill count quite a bit today. Like, what would you say? There was yeah, at least, like, three people there. She doesn't know anybody's name. <laughs> but they were all cheering. I will say, like, there's no sadness for me because they were all being like, ha ha, yeah, we did kill those Starks in cold blood. What up? <laughs> so there's not like any wiggle room for me to be sort of uh, sympathetic to them. Yeah, I might have felt a little bit worse if she would have killed uh, the wife. But she's like, just because she's not like she had nothing to do with what Walter Frey was doing. She's a victim of him as much as anybody else is. I wonder if that's that's an interesting thing, because so this is not in the text of the episode. But now there is this power vacuum at the twins which was not a massive player ever really in the whole larger game of Thrones that we are playing, but it it does have some significance. I wonder if all of these women that Walder Frey brought up around him are going to take over what's left of this kingdom. We're going to end up with Queens all over the place. If that's, if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that I would like to see that. I don't know if they'll even need to come back to the twins or if that'll be an important thing. I, Arya meets some guys that are at later on who are kind of on their way there, and we'll talk about that when we get to that scene. But it's not – like there, there's we don't understand exactly what strategic significance that area has at the moment to this war that's being fought. And it definitely has strategic importance just because of the bridges and everything involved. But we'll see which side they fall on because – they were with the Lannisters, and now it's kind of wide open. I could still see them going with the Lannisters, especially because it was the North remembers as the thing that killed everybody. But we'll yeah. see. 
I would love it if Arya made a new like th- th- that woman that or the little girl I think it was that she was like the North remembers little girl's gonna grow up and, and do the exact same thing like oh <laughs> you think it's cool to kill my family no I'm gonna go on this whole epic quest this is gonna be like season nine of Game of Thrones is just her story <laughs> after all the White Walkers are done she comes back and she's like oh by the way remember me stab <laughs> I want <laughs> that would be so the phrase remember yeah I guess so. I mean, they already uh, kind of we... did that with the whole Red Wedding. They were remembering past sins against them, so it's just this cyclical thing that where everybody yeah, dies. Ends. Yeah, that's part of why uh, some of our friends stopped watching the show because it was just like you could look at this at any point in history, and it's just horror. Nobody wins. Nobody's good. Speaking of people not being good, uh, we do get, and this is a very short scene, but it's very effective. That you mentioned it earlier the 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 winter coming. As a physical, almost like a literal physical form, the storm that follows along with the White Walkers, beautiful, I think a one shot. I don't believe there's a single cut in this, what I'll call a scene. I think it's about a minute long. Yeah, it's probably entirely CGI from the ground up. Maybe like the establishing shot with the winds blowing the snow around. Like, I think the people are real. I think the, like, you're not going to CGI the walking guys. They probably put makeup on them and weird contacts and well i, I was wondering because light. they they made them a lot skinnier than looked like actual human form there's a lot of giants there's a lot of other stuff going on here that's part of what made the scene so effective is because people have talked about well, what would happen if one one became a white walker and yep. then all of a sudden they've already got like three or four giants in just this little scene Did, was that one one do you think i mean i put no, down i don't think one one was turned because he died like in winterfell okay Okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. He at did the have wall, one maybe. eye, but... He was at the wall, and these guys, like, are not at the wall. I don't know what the geography is. I don't. I need to see some arrows of, like, okay, they attacked <laughs> here, and then they retreated, and now they're moving along this way. I'd give I it don't... about 98% that it wasn't 1-1, one, one, also because 1-1 one, one got shot in the other eye. I watched that episode today. Okay. Tony doing the research. I picked it right up. I just watched the previous layout. I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I just wanted to watch uh, episode nap. nine and ten again from last season because those were incredible episodes. And still in the north, we follow that up with Bran coming home. Uh, not much substance to this scene, but it, it is kind of a big deal because we're about to have Bran, I would assume, reuniting with John. Yeah, it, it can't mean, be that far off. Well, I mean, in, in TV world, yeah. it can't be that far <laughs> off. In the books, it would be like, and then they had to travel for three months to get to Winterfell, and there was a storm, and they got attacked by a ro- roving band of foxes or something. <laughs> you know, it would take half the half the dang book to get there. Yeah, well, but, it did take six seasons to get Daenerys over to, like, the Seven Kingdoms. That's true. So, like, I just, th- I like to think about... Again, when, if, I say when, if George R. R. Martin finally writes these books, like, all right, how long is this going to take to to do in the books? Well, there's or is a, it the, even going to happen the same way? If you look in the in the trailers for season seven, you actually see that uh, a red woman is walking up the steps of Dragonstone. So there's a little bit of uh, fast forwarding happening, and it's been happening more, more and more since probably season four, I've noticed, where people just get to places. <laughs> They got that fast travel on. Yeah. They unlocked them, and now they're uh, now they can get there faster, Tony. Yeah, that's that's, a, that that's always a pain in the ass. You got to like get to each of the uh, locations, and then you can finally fast travel. They found that guy with the wagon. Yeah, and paid him a thousand gold. <sighs> but but I think I'm sorry. Go ahead. One of the things that had been speculated on for a long time was uh, as soon as uh, Brandon walks through uh, the wall, was it going to collapse? And apparently, that is not the case. As he's brought into Castle Black, or at least one of the castles. Man, by that. Why would they think that that would happen? Uh, there were just people that were talking about it that since he was touched by uh, the Night King and everything, that like there was some sort of mark on him that would bring down the wall. There's a lot of weird stuff with that. Oh, I thought that maybe if he was beyond the wall, it meant they could get through. In the books, there's the whole horn MacGuffin that is supposed to be able to bring down the wall. I don't think they've mentioned that in the. They may have mentioned it, but it certainly hasn't been like, guys, where's that horn at? We need to keep track of that <laughs> horn. It can bring down the wall. Yeah, that definitely seems like you something you would just destroy right now. It's like, don't even give it a chance. <laughs> but the wildlings had it when they were attacking, and now, I, again, the books are a whole different deal. So the, 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 the next scene, though, is probably, I think I would say, the first one that really has a lot of meat in this episode. It's John and Sansa kind of, 
I mean, John is the king in the north now. He's been elected. He's the guy with the official power. But him and Sansa are sort of trying to co-rule here, or at least Sansa is trying to co-rule with John. Uh, and they have to make some important decisions. They have to. Des John decides to, you know, arm the the women and the and the men, which I, th I thought was a cool sort of pragmatic. Like, listen, we, we're with <laughs> the people we're fighting. We can't afford to be only with half of our population. And once and again, Lyanna Mormont just like lays down the law on this. Like, she's basically yes. there to just yell at like not the car starks. I can't remember the guy that was talking there, like who that was. But there's a there's a lot of lords that just get put in their place by her on a regular basis. I want to, you know what? I do want to see, like, I don't want her to become a walking meme, and that's <laughs> sort of what I've seen from her in this episode. I'd really like a little bit more character time with her, and I, we only have a limited time this whole season, but I really would enjoy digging more into her background and what drives her. And I, I don't know, you know, enough about her. I think it, that, 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 that could be an interesting. Especially because last season, they kind of stumbled onto this girl and decided that she was going to be a, a little bit bigger than this season because of how popular she was. I'll be disappointed if we don't at least see her firing some arrows into some white walkers at some point. <laughs> right. But John and Sansa have this disagreement about how to deal with these treasonous families. You know, Sansa and and here so so John wants to pardon them, says we need their help. You know, uh the, the castles didn't do I love the line the castles didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> um but more importantly, he says the the other members of the family weren't part of the treason. We're gonna reinstate them to their family homes. And Sansa is coming at this from a completely different world. I mean, I, I keep thinking about just what she's been through and the types of political machinations she's witnessed and she's learned from. And her advice here is to essentially not salt the earth, but definitely not give these people that betrayed them any kind of a foothold to ever do that again. Yeah. And it makes sense whenever you're looking at like the very the very idea of like you have to reward the supporters that stayed loyal like there are families that that rose to the challenge even though they didn't really have the resources to fight against Ramsay and to fight against everybody else so they should get handsomely rewarded for it you're kind of setting up a bad example whenever it's like oh we're just going to cut their heads off i understand both sides of it though especially cuz like those kids were literally in the room like the umbers and the car starks <laughs> like they're sitting there and they're talking about destroying their whole families and it's like we're right here guys <laughs> well she does she's come through the again learn essentially learning from cersei in the sort of scene right after this john says to her you know you sound like you admire her and even though she's suffered at cersei's hands essentially she kind of does she does not shoot that down completely she's I think she sees Cersei as kind of someone who she doesn't like, but that she has she has pulled things from, that she's learned things from. And she kind of wants to model herself as Cersei but good. I don't know if that's a thing you can do. <laughs> I think you can definitely take the more powerful aspects on how to survive from Cersei, if nothing else. That's true. But the, uh, the, the other side of that is, is Jon coming at this from his perspective where he died and came back and he's done with the killing he's like no i'm sick like I, I got in this mess of being this weird resurrected dude because i played that part that father told me how to play that told me to play the the strict disciplinarian the guy who meets out justice the one who cuts off the head of the man that he sentenced and it did not work out for me okay <laughs> i'm not doing that anymore and I, you can definitely see his perspective there, too. Yeah, definitely. Like, I I think that at this point, he's... Well, he's not broken by any means. We saw him at the last battle. We saw what he's able to do. He's good at ruling. It's like Sansa said, but there's just a point where it's like, I already have to, like, defend this entire world from all these wildlings, and you want me to go and kill off a few more hundred people and take their stuff. Yeah, I think he's sick of justice. <laughs> I could if see that. If that makes sense. Like, he doesn't... He, he's sick of meeting out some kind of judgment on people. He just... Like, he wants people just to 
to cut it out. He's like, we've got bigger problems. I don't want to go deal with Cersei. I don't care about her or what she did to our family or what she wants to do to me. I've got the real deal. The winter is coming and it's people walking in a snowstorm with giants and we got to fight them. <laughs> and then you've got Littlefinger in the background smiling because he knows that Jon is just giving him more ammo to work with with, Cer- uh, with Sansa. And th- I still think Sansa's going to remain loyal, but I think she's going to be brought to the brink by it. That's a tough one. I, I did love that moment where she's talking with uh, with Greyjoy and, you know, the uh, what's her name? Thag Nabbit, the cool giant lady. Brienne? And Brienne of Tarth, thank you. You're yes. not talking about Greyjoy, uh, you're talking about uh, Littlefinger. That's correct. So I've gotten all the names wrong in that <laughs> sentence, except for Sansa, and I apologize. She's talking to uh, Littlefinger, and Brienne walks up, and she has her great cutting comment about, don't feel the need to have the last word. I'll assume it was something clever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but it, Brienne, you know, rightly senses that, you know, he wants something. And Sansa says, I know what he wants, which is, uh, I, I think, really interesting look into her perspective. And the fact that she's used what he wants to get something for her and her family. The reason, I mean, the reason that they're whole all here and alive and not dead is because she convinced Littlefinger to bring his army to the battle of the bastards and sort of come in at the last second and save the day. Yeah. And it's like, she didn't get no respect for that. Yeah. She's sort of in his pocket for that in a lot of ways, but also I'm not sure she's at the point where she like, where she's going to be swayed by that leverage because he doesn't have anything else on her right now. It's like the deed is already done. That's true. I think she'll honor a certain amount of stuff, but she, I mean, he wants her like yeah. if for people who are not keeping up with Sansa and Littlefinger, like Littlefinger got the hots for Sansa because Sansa looks like Sansa's mom used to. And Littlefinger <laughs> had the hots for Sansa's mom. Not to mention so, as she gets older, she actually like, she is acting more like Catelyn Stark as well. Like there's a, there's definitely a different level of grace and less helplessness involved with everything related to Sansa. Yes. Speaking of uh, interesting points of view clashing, the next scene is Cersei and Jaime uh, standing on the giant map that we saw on the, uh, on the, in the trailer, which I think I like Jaime's reaction to that. He's like, what are you, are you like? Just, what is this like a art project or something? I mean, he, <laughs> He Civic was project. not quite that dismissive, dismissive, but it was, it was a little bit funny. He he thinks that Cersei's sort of going overboard here. Yeah, and she's just walking along the very middle of the map, kind of near where I like where the twins were for the phrase, and it just shows that she's kind of lording over the entire thing right there. Well, she wants to anyway. Yeah. This is her vision of the world. Her standing atop it, you know, towering above all the kingdoms. Well, it's and it's also interesting if you have a parallel with that, with the uh, the map that's inside of Dragonstone, and we see that more at the end. That one was actually done by one of the Targaryens back in the day, and there are, are no borders on it because it belonged to them. Like, there were no borders of states, of kingdoms, of anything else, and Cersei pretty much has the same thing on that map. There are no differentiations between the North and the South and Dorne and all that. Like, that is their place. I, I like the perspective shift. And again, when we talked about it between Sansa and Rob, and here we have two more siblings kind of having the same thing where Cersei, I, I think she has to have this vision of winning and the kingdom and her destiny fixed in her head or she'll fall apart. And Jamie is able to more sort of, at least wants to process things a little bit more. He's more realistic about their chances. He says, you know, we've got, you know, not enough allies. Of course, she's invited some allies over as we find out in a little bit, but um, you know, we're, we're basically surrounded by enemies and also, Hey, our kids just died. Yeah. You want to talk about that? And she can't essentially. Yeah. She immediately she, just runs over to the wine. It's like one of the only human things you really see from her in the past couple of seasons is like anytime somebody mentions her kids. But she doesn't have that anymore. She's cut off from that and she does not, she's not allowing herself to grieve. She's pushing forward in, into this world that she's created. She's going to, in her mind, she has to make this world a reality. And she hasn't even, I love the, the moment where she says, oh, you know, it's going to be this legacy. And 
Jamie says, it's who's at a legacy for, you know, our kids are dead. We're the last of the, the Lannisters essentially. And she, there, there's a beat there where you realize she hasn't thought about that. She's, she's been a land. She's been operating in this Lannister's going to win forever mode for so long that that's a little bit, I mean, it doesn't shake her. It's not like she decides not to, uh, it, it, she's just almost forgotten that this is it, that they're it for, for, for the Lannisters. And yet she still pushes on. She's like, well, it'll be for us then. Yeah. And I wonder if she actually is too old to like have any more kids. Like I couldn't see Euron wanting to just stop there, like and not Jamie have any sort of offsprings. Kids. That's true. Technically, Jamie he could. swore an oath, but I well, mean, he's kind of been absolved of a lot of different oaths. <laughs> yeah, like he's like he's not even part of any sort of Kingsguard anymore. He's just in the full Lannister army armor and everything. Like I don't know if he had to rescind everything, but I'm sure that like he could be entitled to Lannister properties and everything if like if the Queen just said so. That's true. And there doesn't seem to be much, I never can tell how much is left between them as far as, uh, love slash lust goes, uh, as things have progressed for their characters, Cersei doesn't seem to need him very much, although I think she'll use him, you know, if that's something that she's feeling, but he still, I think is really starting to feel the, the loss of that relationship and wondering He's kind of looking around now and saying, well, what is left for me? You know, my sister has turned into this power hungry, complete psycho, essentially. Yeah. Well, I still good. love. He's still going towards the opposite side of the spectrum where he just wants to be a respected man again. He wants to be a good knight and a good person. And like he just looks at her as like going completely the opposite direction. Right. He doesn't have his kids anymore. Who, I mean, they were his kids and he did love them, even if he couldn't really be in public with it. He has his dad's dead. His brother, who he, you know, cared about enough to let go, is now marching on his not not directly on King's Landing yet, but very much giving aid and comfort to the enemy who wants to kill him. So he doesn't have like anybody left in the world. I kind of feel bad for Jamie. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> but at the end of that scene, you see them walking or in the uh, throne room. And Euron walks in looking all cleaned up. It's the most cleaned up, like, Ironborn we've seen in a very long time. That's some really sweet looking ships, by the way. Yeah. Like, they, those were some... they built those quick. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> he probably think... had the flagship already, I'm sure, but still. Is that... Did they get money from the Lannisters to build those ships? Do you think there's already been some collusion going on there? It'd be interesting to find out. I'm not entirely sure. Like, I haven't it seen seemed... it. What was it end of season five where he was like, we're going to build new ships or maybe it was middle of season six. It was somewhere around there. It was uh, right whenever he took control, which I think was towards the end of season six. I mean, we've mocked fast travel a little bit already, but if he's got that whole fleet built in like several days, they don't even have that many trees on the iron islands. Yeah. <laughs> they had to go so, and pillage. I'm sure. Uh, it seems a little bit unlikely to me, but and, and they didn't steal the entire Iron Fleet either. They just stole like whoever was loyal. It's not like you can just steal all the cars and not have people to, or all the ships and not have people to take care or drive them. <laughs> steal steer all them. the cars. Yeah, steal all <laughs> the cars. We got some Grand Theft Auto happening here. It's, it's Fast and Furious Nine Medieval yeah. Edition. Yeah, it's post-apocalypse, like really, really far post-apocalypse. Oh man, don't don't. Don't do that to me. <laughs> um, and his, you know, he wants a queen. He wants legitimacy. And Cersei, I mean, she's not any slouch. She doesn't play the game maybe quite as well as some other people, but she definitely doesn't just jump into bed with him, literally or figuratively. She's like, I, I, I love how it's. She, she starts out making the argument to Jamie, oh, we can trust these guys. Like, we need them and, and we can get something from them. And then when he shows up, she uses that against him. Like, I don't know if we can trust you, man. You've killed all the people you worked with before. <laughs> and, uh, and really gets him to go off and do some dirty work for her without really committing anything. Yeah. And it's just because he wants to kill off like, I, uh, that's Yara, I believe as yeah, well as Yara. several other people that are currently in command of the rest of the iron fleet. So yeah, I think he's probably going to make, honestly, when he gets over there, there's a decent chance he's going to make a pitch to Daenerys, though. I mean, he is willing to go with whichever side. 
is going to give him what he wants, which is legitimacy. And if Daenerys marries him, I think he'll flip in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I'm not sure what Yara would do with that. That would just lead to some very awkward dinner conversations. <laughs> I, I do love how like he was basically just shitting on Jamie the whole time, too. That was great. Like he, that was really... Um, there I am with two good hands. <laughs> you should try killing like, your wow, brother subtle sometime. Much? It feels great. Yeah, he was okay. not very subtle. But it, <laughs> it, it like I just like that. I like how whenever he steps forward, the mountain just kind of rolls up. You see the new King's Guard in full black. Cersei's always in full black. I don't know if that's because she's mourning or if that's just the new persona she's taken on. I guess uh, before... Tommen killed himself like she was wearing that same sort of regalia too. I like that that dress that she's got on this episode. Yeah, like the the shoulder pauldrons like... and everything. It's definitely more like a war queen than it is like some just like King's Landing landing nice queen. There's like some details on the front too. I don't know if they're like runes or just sort of interesting little uh, bits and pieces. But uh, anyway, just great costume design. Yeah, the costume always. design this season has been on to or has been awesome. I, it always has been, but it feels like they've they've really had enough time to hone in on the style of the world, get everyone where they need to be. Daenerys looked a little bit weird with the shoulder pads, but I also can see that it's kind of scale and everything, so it fits with like her style too. I did not notice the shoulder pads on Daenerys. Well, they're just like jutting out, like a little bit weird, but okay. They like I trust they're you. also I just were, didn't notice it. They were also dragon scale and everything, so I could it it worked. All right. So anyway, on to the next scene. Next scene is Sam in the Citadel, having fun with soup and other soup. Yeah, soup and poop. That was pretty <laughs> yeah. much uh, the, it was one of the weirder montages I've ever seen in Game of Thrones, but it, it reminded me so much of uh, that uh, Pink Floyd song, Money, just like with yeah. the way it started to like turn into kind of musical with him like gagging and the sound of pots and everything else just kind of going, him putting books back. You got Sam the CNA, it's how you get to be a meister apparently. Yeah, I, 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 I've referenced this already several times in the episode, but I guarantee you, in the books, that sequence is going to be like a whole book. <laughs> George R. R. Martin gets, gets around to writing that. Sam's going to spend like, you know, each chapter like, oh, he looked at the thing and then he met a mouse and befriended the mouse and the mouse ran off and the mouse was free and he's not free. And like, I don't know. It's it's just, it's going to be long and drawn out. And I'm Thank you for the montage, Game of Thrones TV show. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, we don't need to know about like the different Meister's consistency and regularity. Uh, that will definitely be part of it. <laughs> I don't want to. You know what? I'm not trying to take a dump on the books. I enjoy the books as well, and there it is fun to get that extra detail. But there are those moments sometimes where it's like, yeah, we don't like. It's good sometimes just to get there. <laughs> uh, and here we are. We we see him dealing with his stuff and his basic thing is hey i'm here to help you guys are just making me do menial work like it's the end of the world <laughs> you don't understand it's the end of the world and like i love the the conversation he has with the guy yeah, the archmeister archmeister yeah which it seems weird that the archmeister is the one doing like autopsies but whatever man it works i don't know if arch means like the highest or if it's just one of the upper guys yeah that i, could I didn't be get a handle on that it didn't seem like he was in charge of everything he's just sort of one of the people in charge yeah one of and, the and authorities I think for the citadel anyway he does have a good point it's like listen everybody always thinks it's the end of the world we're the we're the memory of this you know this world and it hasn't been the end of the world yet even when the long night was here you know, when what, the last time when the White Walkers attacked, it did not destroy the whole world. I think things will be fine. Yeah, but that was mostly through the aid of, like, the children of the forest and all these other things. So it's, uh, it's a little bit scarier this time. I, yeah, but I can see his perspective. I know how he came to that perspective. It, it, it's a very well-informed opinion. He's, yeah. Now, he could still be wrong. I mean... You know, there's always something that could be the end of the world. But I think in general, he's right that people are always looking for, like, the worst thing to happen. And it turns out it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and a lot of this was also established just to sh show that Sam ran out of patience, ended up stealing the keys, and started stealing books uh, in order to try to help out in any way he could. And he finds out that Dragonstone is just completely laid with obsidian and dragon glass and wants to get that message to John. 
It also finds out where there a lot of it is, uh, which is at. Uh, oh, you already said Dragonstone. Yep, underneath They're Dragonstone trying to is get like Dragon Glass. Yep, I. That's the thing you just said, Tony. <laughs> it's all good. My brain heard Dragonstone and was like, "Yeah, that glass stuff," <laughs> and did not think about the place. On to page two of the notes. Uh, yeah, you've got multiple pages. I've got I've like a basic bullet point outline. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I, I will say this next scene we're going to talk about where Arya stops with the soldiers. I, favorite is a strong word. I mean, there's a lot of really great scenes, but I, it was nice to be reminded because this whole scene, I'm like, oh, something bad's going to go down. Oh, these guys are going to try to kill her or steal her money or rape her or something. And it was great to be reminded that, like, not everybody in the world of Game of Thrones is a monster. Yeah, and they set this up to make it feel like something bad was going to happen, but it was really just some Lannister soldiers, like, at the end of their day of marching, like, having some food and talking. And also Ed Sheeran, out of nowhere, just singing. I don't know who Ed Sheeran is. Ed Sheeran is a, uh, like, did you ever hear that Icy Fire song for uh, the Hobbit movies? Probably. Well, he's he's a major singer out there. Like he was the one who uh, got me to do that parting glass song for the the okay. Minecraft dirt block back in the day, and he was the redheaded guy that was singing the song. I remember. I like the song. I like the the way he was singing it. And I remember what you're talking. The the several of the songs for the Hobbit were really good. I just didn't know his name. Yeah, and Somebody so mentioned it on the subreddit, but I was like, I don't know who that guy is. Yeah. Well, sometimes pop culture, at least for that type of thing, isn't your strong suit. But it was nope. kind of cool to see him, but it was also kind of jarring for me because I was like, oh, this isn't Game of Thrones. This is Ed Sheeran. But he had a small role, and it was a nice touch to the scene. And it was, a, like you said, it was a, a very good contrasting thing, showing that almost everybody else is just fighting other people's wars. They don't have a lot of choice other than maybe proximity to where they were born for how, like, which side they end up on. And some of those people still could be bad people. Yeah. I mean, we've seen grunts do terrible things as well, but... It's it's not guaranteed. This world is not only violence and hate and you know, like all the bad things that you could imagine. There's a possibility of something good coming out of it. And it kind of makes you feel bad that, well, I mean, obviously you feel bad anyway, but that, that Cersei killed off the sparrows. You know, that, that whole movement was about the people, right? And maybe it wouldn't have worked out you know, a lot of times people's movements have somebody take over and kind of uh, become a dictator of some kind. But to, to sometimes have... it's the only way to consolidate power, though. I was reading a book called The Dictator's Handbook recently, and it detailed the exact reasons why that seems to happen. Like uh, whenever somebody takes over for a people's movement, they have to kind of give enough power to these essential backers and other people that were still sort of in power in the first place. Otherwise the entire thing collapses and it goes into a cycle of like the people's armies, killing the people, killing everything around them. Yeah. Yeah. Life is complicated. (laughs) Let's just leave it at that. This this is not a a deep dive on that, but yeah, the, the, the common man here is not much benefited one way or the other, uh, based on who's on the throne. And uh, there's a lot of common men that are going to get killed in these upcoming wars, and these are some of them. Yep, probably. In fact, we might get, <laughs> we might get back to seeing them. And speaking of seeing people a dead that were alive before, uh, we cut we get to the Hound and Beric Dondarrion out uh, gallivanting around, and they mis- visit a house that is familiar to the Hound. Uh, he tries to talk them out of going in, but. Turns out uh, this is the place from season four where he went in and stole the f- money and food, I believe, from the father and her, his daughter and left them to die in the winds of winter. And sure enough, it's winter now and they have died. Yeah. And, and he has to look at them. It was probably a suicide or a murder suicide, basically, where the, the father killed his daughter, then killed himself because they weren't going to survive the winter. They were probably already starving. And it was. Like, as soon as I saw that house, I was thinking back to that particular scene. I, I'm not sure if it was season three or season four, but... I read I, season four from somewhere. Yeah. That, that, I, I always just felt terrible about that scene. And that was, that, like, that was a changing point for Arya where she, like, she started to have a connection with the Hound. And then she stopped having a whole lot of connection with him after that point. Well, and we see now, 
I, I think it's great because the, the Hound, yes, has been sort of going through this transformation, but it's really great to see him here interacting with his past. That he's that the, to have to face the things that he's done head on and deal with them and make peace with them. And here he is with all these sort of religious do-gooders um, that he kind of looks down on, but also can't deny the power of, you know, he, he, and he's here. He has his vision in the flames at yeah. this point. Thoros tells him to like, look into the flames and see if there's anything there for him. And I didn't think he was going to see anything. And he sees everything. <laughs> Like, well, yeah, he gets a vision of the the wall. He hasn't been to the wall yet, by the way, he, right? I'm, I'm not he wrong was about that. he was supposed to get to the wall, and then that got derailed a few different ways. Like he, it took him like two and a half seasons to almost get to the wall. Okay, uh, but he you know sees the sort of the whole stick with the the White Walkers heading to the the fortress and stuff. But it, it's it's a mirror of what's going on. Like it, th- I don't think he could have had this vision if he was the old hound. The fact that he is here facing his old ghosts and confronting the self that he used to be is what unlocks this for him, in my mind anyway. Uh, it's not spelled out explicitly, but he's sort of, he's coming around to this thing that he doesn't believe in purely, I mean, based on evidence, obviously, he's seeing yeah. it happen. And but it's, also, it's not that he doesn't believe in the gods, it's that he resents them, I think. Like, uh, he always thinks that it, it should be a lot simpler for them to give their displays of power to tell them what he needs to do to, like, interact and make it so that they're not just, like, kind of an abstract. And this right. time and he, he actually says... gets his his, thi- his wish on that. He actually gets to see a vision based on, uh, based on uh, this particular god. I do like, though, he's still saying things like, listen, if there was, if, if the gods were dispensing any kind of justice, you would be dead <laughs> to Beric Dondarrion. And how he so flatly tells him, listen, there's nothing special about you. I've known much better people than you that got killed and didn't come back. Uh, why is, and, and Beric doesn't know, and the Hound is kind of annoyed about the fact that he doesn't know. And... But you still can't did not again. You can't argue with the results. Yeah, you can be annoyed with the results as much as you want, but he's he's still there. Yeah, but it's also uh, that like uh, Thoros knows the words for the resurrection. He just says them and they work. Like it might not even like it could just be some weird pattern where it keeps happening and Thoros just happens to be around. Like that's basically yeah. what Thoros said: is he knows the words, he knows the incantation. But like, yeah, but if it was that easy, other people, well, I, I say other people would do it. I mean, Melisandre did it, but I can't believe that it's just sort of anybody can just read these words off and people come back. Yeah. And there, especially so many times. Yeah. There has to be some kind of actual power there. And did Darian was killed? I, I remember he said how many times I can't remember exactly. I it thought was it like was thir- seven. Yeah. At one point it was seven. And the Hound got him another time, and so he's been brought back quite a few times. Yeah, he doesn't come back perfect, though. He lost his eye, and that stayed gone. Yeah, and also, it's from what I read about the books in the Resurrection, it always comes back a little bit more hollow, a little bit less themselves. So I'm not sure... It also depends on how long you've been dead. There's some stuff in the books that happens... uh, with somebody who was dead for a while and came back, and they were not okay. I'm guessing they it was uh, some... Lady Stone something something. Yeah, Lady Stoneheart. I guess it's not a spoiler to say that. A because it's not in the move in the show. Yeah, at we all, we and... tried skirting that a lot last season, thinking that it might pop up. We won't go into also, too many details. Also, because saying saying the words Lady Stoneheart, I don't think would spoil what it is until you actually know what it. Is. Well, forward is uh, just a little scene following up with Sam in the Citadel, and we find out where Jorah wound up and what happened with his grayscale. It got worse, and he's here in the Citadel. Did they have, like, a treatment? I mean, I- I'm wondering why he's here at all. I kind of wonder if that's, like, just a research place. Like, if they're trying... Like, it seems like the Meisters are experimenting with a lot of different medications. Like, that's part of the thing that Meisters do, is that they, like, they help people who are ailing. But, uh, like, it almost seems like that's more of a research thing for <laughs> for a guy like that, where they know he's doomed, and they're just gonna, like, check it out a little more. It's, I don't know what the, what the purpose of him being there is, but I guess we'll find out. I mean, and it's really cool to see him back. 
it's weird to see him with the character that we haven't seen him with before. Like he's been a, essentially exclusively a Daenerys Targaryen adjacent character. Uh, and now we're kind of crossing over into Sam and the, you know, I mean, Sam's not with the Night Watch, but that set of people. Uh, I wonder if they're going to interact anymore or if it's just like uh, Jorah finds out where Danny is. And what she's doing, and what she's doing is she's coming home to Greystone. Yep, Dragonstone. That's <laughs> it's past names. Al's bedtime. I know it doesn't seem like it's it that is. late for whenever this is going to be coming out, but Al has a bedtime of like eight thirty. It's ten nineteen here at the moment <laughs> in the evening. Uh, I had a good nap though, Tony. I'm just dumb. That's my problem. But uh, she's coming home, and there's. Not a lot of, like, substance to this scene. It's just sort of really uh, giving you the sense that this is her returning to the seat of power of the Targaryens. Uh, she sees, you know, she walks in, pulls down the banner of, uh, uh, what's his face? Stannis. He got killed off screen. Stannis, yes, thank you. Um, and walks into the, the throne room, and there she is. She says, shall we begin? And... I hope we do. I, I do. There was a little more gravity to that situation than what you're saying. Like, you're talking about the culmination of her life's work so far, where all she's wanted is to bring her armies across the sea. She gets out of the boat. She puts her hand in the sand. And it becomes real that she's in Westeros now. That's true. But here's my caveat to all that. She... It, and this isn't as strong in the show, but I've re having read the books... Daenerys wanted at some point to go home, but for her, she, the only home that she really remembered was this house in wherever the city was that she grew up, uh, where she was being protected and coming to Dragonstone might be symbolically very important, but this is not her home. It's also like she's, empty too. Like there's no life in Dragonstone. Yeah, she's got she's coming to this empty place that has she has no personal emotional connection with. And I think that that's an interesting place for her character to be. I don't maybe they won't play it out that way in the show. Maybe she'll totally own it and just pick up here and this is this is where I belong. I'm a Targaryen and this is, you know, I'm taking it. But I I like the idea of her kind of constantly searching for a place to belong and never really being able to find it. And I don't know if that's going to get addressed. Like, is she going to feel comfortable whenever she gets to uh, King's Landing? Like, it, we'll see where she goes as a character because she's changed so much since the beginning of the series, too. Yeah, it's... She's lost a lot of... her. I mean, everybody's lost a lot of innocence. She's kind of gone through a similar arc to Sansa, although she has the power and Sansa does not, at least not much. Um, So... It's uh, I I, I want to see where she goes. I I, th I really want to see what happens when she meets Euron. I think there's, I mentioned it earlier, but solid, uh, flip a coin chance that <laughs> he tries to proposition her with the same offer he gave to Cersei, and he is not loyal to anybody. No, he's not. He like he could basically change with the tides. It's something where. Whenever he goes to see her, I think a lot of it's going to depend on uh, Yara's reaction. Also, I think that he's a lot more dangerous to them than they suspect. Like, uh, she burned down a lot of ships from people that weren't, like, the most veteran sailors. This is, like, the Iron Fleet with people who have been probably trying to figure out ways to bring dragons down for a long time, especially over open water. Like, it seems like there could actually be some deaths to her dragons in those fights. It just feels a lot more menacing than anything else she's had to face so far. Like with the How Masters, with all of these other people, it seemed like they were uh, not easy to overcome, but they did seem like they were uh, they were foes that were a little bit out of their league trying to take her on. And now she's in a far off land having to deal with foes on all sides. I don't, I mean, dragons against ships really seems like a tough fight for the people in the ships. Even I, I would I would feel a lot better on land because at least like I mean the land might burn but you can kind of run away from the burning there. If they burn your ship, you're just it's either that or the ocean. Yeah, so that's true. But it's also like if the dragons get dragged down, they could just drown them. Like get a few heavy uh, like uh, bolts into them with some chains on them and just drag the dragons down. 
we'll see how they do it. I'm sure there's going to be some interesting things with those battles coming up. Yeah, I guess I guess we'll have to wait and see. And we will uh, shortly. How many episodes this season? I, forget. I believe it's seven. And the last seven one episodes. is uh, 90 minutes. The one prior to that is 71 minutes. So there's going to be some kind of movie length things going on towards the end of this season. But they couldn't do 10 because they shot their wad on all of the uh, battle sequences. It was still over $100 million to produce this season. So I'm pretty excited to see where it goes. We haven't seen hardly any of that money yet, by the way. Yeah. Like, there was the one nice effect shot of the White Walkers that was, again, kind of long, but not... I mean, I'm not going to price anything out. But there was a lot of scenes of people in rooms talking this episode. Uh, so there's a lot still left to see. Yeah, and I'm sure armor season. and everything costs a fair bit, but they could recycle that quite a lot. So yeah. I did watch the uh, the trailer for the next episode, but it's always a little bit weird with see, uh, the first episode of a season because they'll usually tease more than what's happening in the next episode. They just want to get you hyped up for the season. So it's like, are we really going to see Jon Snow throwing Littlefinger against the wall next episode? Are we going to see... Like, oh, I buy that 100%. Yeah, I could definitely <laughs> see that. But... I think Jon Snow will just do that just to warm himself up for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> But I also wonder what type of thing that uh, Littlefinger could tell him to get him that pissed off. There's a lot of things, but it could also be him learning his heritage. Or not his heritage, his parentage. So we'll see what happens there. There's a lot of interesting things that are going to be going on with this season. I'm psyched. I was all pumped up just hearing the intro music again. So we're back in Game of Thrones. And I think that's everything I have for this particular episode. I'm good as well. Thank you all for listening. If you end up liking this, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and check out our other stuff over at humanechoes.com or on this YouTube channel. We've got a ton of content we're putting out every week. Lots of gaming, lots of everything. We also have special uh, a special podcasts for our members and a lot of really cool stuff on the horizon. So check out humanechoes.com or subscribe to the YouTube channel today. Have a good one, guys. See you next week. Bye. I won't. I mean, I'll be on vacation next week. I'll be here. I'll probably have somebody. Yes. The podcast. We'll see you next week. It'll be me by my lonesome. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Get you you a a co-host. Probably.